question. All right. Now, something that you would have seen in Calc 2 is parametric equations. So let's first start off by talking about the uh, relationship between parametric equations and vectors. 11.6, let's talk about parametric equations. So right now we're just talking about, right, for right now we're just gonna talk about parametric equations of a line. So these are just other ways of doing linear functions. Uh, you can graph parametric equations in your graphing calculator. You can do it on Desmos. So if you ever wanna see what these things look like, there are plenty of ways uh, to plot them. And if you have questions about that, you can ask Professor Tarr or myself, um, but you just need to change your mode to, to parametric in your calculator and you can do parametric equations. We're gonna look at some very specific things about parametric equations. Number one, this would be in 2D. So not right now we're in the 2D plane. So this would be uh, parametric equations that start, that go through a point x0, y0, and they have a slope of A in the X direction and B in the Y direction, okay? Now we're, we're, we're used to thinking of slope as rise over run because we're looking at a function. When we're doing parametric equations, we think of each variable as having its own slope. That's a good thing though, because that allows us to relate this very easily to vectors because those slopes give us the direction in X and the direction in Y. Therefore, the, the vector that is parallel to this line that we're given is AB. And it is that straightforward. You know, we don't have to think about it. We know if we're given a line in parametric, AB is going to be the vector that is uh, parallel with it. Um, that, that same relationship holds, oh, and the other thing to mention is if we're thinking about the slope of what this, you know, the slope of this line in 2D, Y with respect to X, well, we've got a rise of B and a run of A. So B over A would be the slope of the line as a function. Same thing goes in 3D. We just have another equation now for Z. That's what's gonna make it go up and down the Z axis. And we will do some really cool stuff later with uh, these parametric equations. Right now, we're just kind of in the tip of the iceberg. You're gonna get a little bit of practice with them today. And the same thing goes with the vector, okay? Just the slopes in the A, B, or excuse me, X, Y, and Z directions. So, Uh, so the, the question I got online is whether or not there should be a preference for what point beginning or end should be picked to fill out the parametric equation. It's going to depend on what we're doing. Right now, we're just looking at parametric equations as infinite lines in 2D and 3D. So there's no particular ending and uh, beginning point. But that is going to be something we take into cons <coughs> consideration as we go on is how do we make a line that starts at one point and ends at another point, in which case we would, um, we would set an interval for T. So uh, if, we wanted this, uh, if we wanted this to go from X zero, Y zero, Z zero to some other point, we might say T equals zero up to whatever our ending value is. Now, that is gonna be something that we do do a little bit of as we move on with parametric equations. Um, because sometimes we do want them to begin and do a line segment instead of an infinite line. But right now, we're not worried about that uh, in, in this section. Okay, changing gears a little bit, <clears throat> linear functions. This is old stuff. In 2D, we've got a slope, change in Y over change in X, right? And B gives the Y intercepts and we get the graph of a straight line. So now we need to expand this into 3D. Well, we talked about this a little bit before, a line, you know, something that makes a line in 2D makes a plane in 3D. 
the only difference now is we have a slope in the x direction and a slope in the y direction. And so what happens is we look at one direction at a time. So if we keep y fixed and we want to know how z changes, z being the output, right now we're calling it f of x, y. How does z change per unit change in x? Well, that's m. So what's nice about this is m is still changing output with re uh, respect to input, but just in the x direction. So what we might say, just to kind of, so m is gives the change in z value with respect to a change in x holding y constant. And n is the change in z value with respect to a change in y holding x constant. Apologies for my messy writing. So for instance, you know, we can, you know, we have calc plot 3D. So let me know. So one of the things, and we're not, like I said, we're not going to draw a whole lot of 3D graphs in here. It's really difficult. Planes are incredibly difficult to draw in 3D. If you ever have to draw a plane in 3D, what you do is you find where it intersects each axis and put a point there and just make a triangle. Okay. That'll kind of at least give you an idea of what the plane should look like because there, it's, it's impossible to draw a plane in 3D on axes when you're looking at a two dimensional piece of paper. Like I said, we're not going to have to draw a whole lot of planes. So I don't want you to worry about that too much. But if you ever have to do it, if you're ever doing it for a problem, that's typically what we do is just mark the axes, intercepts, and then just make a triangle between them. All right. Going back. Okay. So just a couple of things I want to look at with the plane, and then we'll talk about some of those uh, formulas that you saw in the lesson, and then we'll get to work on some problems, which is where the really interesting stuff happens. So if you imagine watching, walking on a tilted plane, so imagine that the floor where you're at is tilted. The slope's not always the same unless we set it to be the same. But if you walk in a direction parallel to the x-axis, you'll always be walking the same slope. You walk in a direction parallel to the y-axis, you're always walking the same slope. Those are those m and n from the previous uh, formula. So what's happening that's creating the linear function is the m and n are constant, right? Just like in 2D, the m is constant, now the m and n are constant. And x, y, and z are all to the first power. We're going to see a couple different forms of a plane. And, you know, depending on what we're doing, one, one form may be more useful than another. But here's kind of a general form. If you wanted, you know, this would be like the, uh, the point normal, uh, not point normal, excuse me, this, the um, point slope form of a line. This would be the point slope form of a plane because. All we need to do is find M and N, and then we can plug in X0, Y0, and Z0. Okay. Now, here's something I want to show you. This is the table for this linear function. So we know that the graph of this is a plane. It is a linear function in 3D. What kind of, what kind of observations do you make uh, about this table? What patterns do you notice? down three. Is there anything in the equation that would have told us that without the table? Yeah. There's the negative three right there. So that tells us as X goes up one, Z goes down three, right? As we go at down, as Y goes up one, the Z values go up two. So that's how those slopes work. Because when we're going 
right across, we're holding y constant. And when we go down, we're holding x constant. Here's another cool one. What do you notice? Let me get this gobbly gook off here. What do you notice about going diagonal? You had an m of negative three and a y of positive two. Add those together, you get minus one. And look at the diagonals. Down one, down one, down one, down one. That's that constant rate of change of the linear function in 3D. Those are the kind of patterns we, we should see. Okay, good. Okay. Now, something we talked about last time, we introduced the concept of the normal vector, right? A normal vector is perpendicular to something. So a normal vector to a plane is perpendicular to the plane. This is gonna be a really cool and a really interesting idea. And I'm gonna walk you through it. All right, suppose we have some plane. All right, this plane passes through the point X, Y, Z and has a normal vector ABC, okay? So we know that ABC is perpendicular to our plane. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick another point in the plane. So here's what's going on. This is something I've been read for once. All right, so here's our plane. We have some point P. And we're gonna pick another point, let's call it Q in our plane. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a vector from, I'm going to do, I'm gonna do from Q to, let me, Q, Q, Q. let me see, I wanna match my notes for Q. Yeah, let's do, let's do Q to P. Okay, well, let's think about the uh, components. I think this is gonna be the opposite of what I have on my slide, but that's okay. Let's think about the components of Q to P, right? Remember it's ending minus beginning point. So the components will be X minus X zero, Y minus Y zero, and Z minus Z zero. All right, so that's that. Now, what we know about that vector is it lies in the plane, right? Well, if I put in the normal vector, let's just let this stand out. If I put in the normal vector, this is our normal vector here. What do I know about the relationship of N with QP? They have to be perpendicular, boom. All right, cool. Here's another thing that we know. What do we know about the dot product between N and QP? Based on what you just told me. Zero. Louder. It's zero. It's zero, right? Because the dot product of two perpendicular vectors must be zero. You guys just uncovered what's called the point normal form of a plane. Like I said, I think I have it backwards. I think I wrote PQ instead of QP. So sorry about that. But what we do is we dot those two together. We know it's equal to zero. And that gives us this guy right here which is called the point normal form of a plane. Why is this awesome? Because all we need, let me say that again, all we need to find the, the formula for a plane is the normal vector and a point in the plane. So this is brilliant. This is, we're gonna use this often. We don't need to derive the point normal form of a plane anymore. We can just use it. We can say, oh, I've got a normal vector and a point. Boom, there's my plane. <laughs> it saves a lot of time. So 
And I will give you a hint. There's going to be one of the problems on the worksheet that's going to ask you to do that. And it is as easy as it sounds. So that's our point normal form of a plane. Now, let's leverage something that we talked about last time with what we just did. All right. Let's talk about a plane in three space. This is a fact. This is some basic geometry. Any three non-collinear points make a plane. That non-collinear means that they're not all three on the same line. So you have any two points is going to lie on the line. If you have a third point not on the line, you can make a plane through those three points, right? So the question becomes, how can we determine the unique plane through three non-collinear points? Well, what are you thinking? I hear it. Yep. So let's say here's our P, Q, and R. And what we can do is we turn two, we make two vectors. Maybe we make one here and one here, right? Now remember what we just saw in the last slide. We need a normal vector and a point that it goes through or a point in the plane. We already have three points in the plane, so we're good there. How can I get a vector normal to the plane? And my hint is that we made two vectors. Think about what we did in the last section. Mm -hmm. The cross product. The cross product of these two vectors will give us a vector that we are guaranteed is perpendicular to the plane that those two lie in. That would be our normal vector. We can use any of those three points. It doesn't matter which one. And we can put together our point normal form of a plane. All right, so anytime we're given three points, as long as they're non-collinear, then we can do the cross product and get a, a vector that's perpendicular to them. That's our normal vector. And then we do our point normal form of a plane. All right. And like I said, there'll be one in the worksheet like that. That's going to be our opportunity to practice cross products. So like I said, all this stuff really starts coming together. OK. Just a couple of uh, other um, formulas that are going to come up that you're going to get to use in the worksheet here in a little bit. Again, we're not memorizing formulas. You'll have a note card for those. We just need to know when to use them. We did this last time, distance between a line and a point. That was the last problem we did at the end of class. It's just a dot product. So all we do is we create a vector between the point P and some point on the line. And then we do the dot product with the normal vector as a unit vector. And boom, we've got the distance. That's the exact same thing we did at the end of class last time. We can expand that. The distance between two non-parallel lines in 3D. So we find a point P on one line and a point Q on the other. OK, this is going to be a very similar idea. We don't care that those points aren't lined up. Any point that's easy to find, all we need is a vector between the two lines. Then we'll find um, a vector U parallel to one line and a vector V parallel to the other. We've talked about that before too. Remember at the very beginning, if, if our lines are given parametrically, we know how to find a vector parallel. Or if we know the slope of the line, we know how to find a vector parallel, right? So again, those are things that are, are, are fairly easy for us to do. Once we have those vectors U and V, well, we need a vector that's perpendicular to both of them. What do we use to find a vector that's perpendicular to given vectors in the normal vector direction? So hopefully you guys are seeing, I know I'm going through these quick, but it's because I'm going to give you time for the worksheet, but hopefully you're seeing how really it's just the same idea applied in different situations, right? All we're doing is a vector projection in the direction of a normal vector. This is what do we want it to be normal to? In the first case, we needed it normal to the line. Now we need it normal to two separate lines, which is why we need the cross product. What if we needed it for a plane? Guys, it's going to be the same idea. If we wanted the distance between a point and a plane, we got some point out in here in space, we got some plane, we'll, we'll pick 
any random point in the plane, make a vector between them, that'll be our PQ. And we already know the normal vector of a plane because we just saw the point normal form. So you put your plane into point normal form if it's not already, get your normal vector, and then you dot PQ with the unit vector in the direction of the normal vector. I think what's funny about these slides, even though these were three different problems, did you notice how the formula always looked the same? PQ dot N over magnitude of N, PQ dot N over magnitude of N. The only difference in each of these was how we found the normal vector, that's it. And that's, again, that's the part that I want you to focus on, not the formula itself. All right. Angle of intersections. Last thing we're going to talk about, and again, I'm just, I just want to, I just want to give you the, the idea behind these formulas so you kind of understand where they're coming from. So the angle between a line and a plane is pi over two minus the angle between the line and the normal vector of the plane. What is, why, you know, why pi over two? Well, remember, this is our normal vector, so it's, oops. It's perpendicular to the plane. So that's our pi over two. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then if we find the angle between the normal vector and the line, call this alpha, well, we would do pi over two minus alpha to get theta, right? Because these two have to add up to 90 degrees for pi over two. So that's why it's saying pi over two minus that. And the reason we do that is because it's easy to find the angle between these two lines. That's what we were doing last time. Remember, we were finding the angle between two vectors. Well, we would know the normal vector because it's just the normal vector of the plane, right? And that's something we're just gonna get used to going back and forth from taking the normal vector, finding a plane, taking the plane and finding its normal vector. We also know how to find a vector that is parallel to this line so once we have those two vectors, then we're just doing the angle between two vectors, which is straight out of the dot product section. I think that was 11.4. All right. So not a brand new formula at all, just thinking about it a little different. Lastly, the angle between two planes. Turns out, this is going to leverage 11.42, that, that dot product, those two dot product definitions. And here's the thing. The angle between two planes is equal to the angle between their normal vectors. So what you would do is you take your two planes, find the normal vector for each, and then find the angle between the normal vectors. What's that? Yep, you got it. So I just wanted to go through those formulas because uh, they are going to be part of problems in the, uh, the worksheet for 11.6. Um, just, so just to give you a little bit of an idea behind where they come from, because I know sometimes they get introduced and they're not talked about too much. 